Welcome everyone to the Q&A session for our upcoming course, Botanical Antivirals, the five-week journey to discover herbal remedies and clinical level formulas for protection from viral conditions. I'm Lisa Bunnies and I'm really looking forward to hosting this Q&A conversation for the Shift Network, where we'll explore the teachings of David Crow and address questions about his upcoming five-week course, Botanical Antivirals, which begins Wednesday, May 13th. And a little later, I'll explain how you can participate in the course, even if you can't attend the live sessions. But first, I want to introduce our guest. David Crow is one of the world's foremost experts and leading speakers in the field of botanical medicine and grassroots healthcare. He's a master herbalist, aromatherapist, and acupuncturist with over 30 years experience and is an expert in the Ayurvedic and Chinese medical systems. David has presented his vision of grassroots healthcare, preservation of botanical medicines, and the use of plants for ecological restoration to hundreds of audiences, ranging from small private groups to conferences to a panel discussion with the Dalai Lama, broadcast internationally to millions of viewers. And we have the rest of our time together to dive into your questions for David as we prepare for his upcoming course. Again, that's called Botanical Antivirals, and it begins Wednesday, May 13th. And if you want to check out the website and learn more about the five-week course, you can visit botanicalantivirals.com to see the full description. And this is a huge and timely topic that David's going to try to answer as many questions as he can during our time together. So let's go ahead and bring him on the line. Welcome, David. It's great to see you today. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to everybody for joining us here, and thank you for sending in so many good questions. Now, just looking these questions over, I was very impressed with the level of understanding about herbal medicine that people have now, and really as we go through these questions, uh, we'll see a lot of good examples about what I'm talking about, how our society is maturing in terms of self-care and how people are becoming much more educated. The kind of questions that have come in for this session really uh, could not have happened even 10 years ago. The level of interest and the level of knowledge and the level of appreciation for natural medicine has grown tremendously. And I think this is one of the really important things that's coming out of our current pandemic situation. And of course, that's a lot of what's on people's minds and uh, the reason for this course. But it's not just for the specific pandemic of this virus that uh, we're doing this course because there are so many different viruses. And I'll be addressing this as we go along. So um, one of the things that a lot of people asked about, actually not in this series of questions, but uh, in questions from the intro call that happened a couple weeks ago, I gave some formulas and many, many people wanted to know what those formulas were. And there's no way to actually post the information. So you might want to have something ready to take notes uh, because I will give that formula. I will give one formula. I gave several, but I'll give one formula again. Uh, so that you can have something to work with. And of course, that's the purpose. Now, as always, there are a lot of questions, literally hundreds of questions to cover. And I organize these in groups so that I can cover main topics. And uh, that way people will have um, as many questions answered as possible. And the first thing I always start with are a few things related to the protocols of the course. And uh, several questions came in like, do you offer certification classes? Are these good for the various continuing education with acupuncture organizations and so forth? And um, I, I would love to take your class. Can I look at it at a later date? Are there any books that go with the course? And the answer is um, no, there are no certifications that come with this course. However, you can contact the SHIFT Network for a letter of completion. And for some organizations, that might be helpful. And uh, otherwise, there's no professional certification for this course. And yes, you can take the course at any time of day, no matter where you are in the world, and Lisa will fill you in on that. 
And yes, there are a lot of PDF files that come with every module. All right, so that's just a, a quick overview of the course, which we're going to be getting into. Uh, Lisa will give you lots of details on, on that also. And also, many, many questions came in about a variety of health conditions. And we don't have time to focus on various kinds of uh, illnesses and health, challenge that you, health challenges that you are having, but I just want to give a very simple answer, and the answer is yes, herbal medicine can help you. So if you asked about various things like Lyme and your chemotherapy and um, fibromyalgia, all these kinds of things, the answer is herbs can help, but this is not dedicated to that particular topic. So here's a, a question that I think sums up everything, all the questions that are on everybody's minds here. And I'll just start with this. It's really simple and it's really complicated. What is the number one plant-based immunity booster against this virus? Well, I'm assuming we're talking about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's the name of the virus. And uh, COVID-19 is the disease that it is causing, the sickness and suffering that it is causing, but I'll have to say that if I knew the answer to that question, I would be the wealthiest man on earth because I would be able to uh, produce that one herb that would give everybody immunity against this virus. And I wouldn't stop there either. Then I would start to produce the one herb that gave people immunity to different viruses. I would produce the one herb that gave immunity to HIV and then to herpes. And I wouldn't stop there either. I would go to the next herb that could uh, uh, reduce everybody's blood pressure to a healthy level and could lower cholesterol and everything. So this is um, a little bit of allopathic thinking here. And that's why we have this question and answer session because we need to understand what herbs do and herbs don't do. And so if we actually look at this question in a little bit of detail, uh, what's the number one plant to boost our immune system against the virus? Well, there's actually all kinds of questions in here because if we really look at this, the main question that uh, comes to my mind right away is, well, what is our immune system? And do we want to even boost it? And the answer is that there are many cases where we don't want to boost the immune system. Autoimmune diseases are one of the uh, primary uh, areas where we have to be careful with immune stimulants. Now, there's a lot of herbs that are immune modulating that are really excellent to use for strengthening our immune system, even when there's autoimmune conditions. So it's not like we can't benefit our immune system, but really, we need to know more about what our immune system is because it's all kinds of things. There's all sorts of different levels of it. And maybe we don't just want to be stimulating it or boosting it. This can be very problematic for a lot of people actually. So we may also want to think about the virus itself. And one of the things we're going to be looking at in the course is this um, amazingly complex life of a virus. And what we see are that the antiviral drugs and the antiviral herbs that are getting a lot of attention now actually work on certain mechanisms of viral replication, like they can prevent the attachment of the virus to the host cell, or they can um, prevent the invasion of the viral contents into the cell or the hijacking of our cells to reproduce more viruses and so forth. And this is really fascinating to know that what herbs have been used for traditionally for viral conditions now has this very sophisticated uh, cellular level of science backing it up. And this is very important because the herbs also have the potential to support and strengthen the uh, uh, effect of the antiviral drugs that are losing their power because uh, as we overuse antivirals, we're getting the same effect as when we've been using overusing antibiotics, which is that the microbes are becoming more resistant. And so a lot of what's driving the research into the antimicrobial 
um, antiviral herbs is looking for compounds and looking for plants that can actually reduce our dependency on the drugs. So to answer that question, is there one herb that will boost our immunity against this virus? Yes and no. And the reason I say yes is because there are a lot of immune boosting supporting herbs that are out there, but we also have to look at them very individually. Is it something that's applicable to you, okay? And is it something that we actually want to do? And what's the role of the antivirals as opposed to the immune boosting? So we have to think about it very holistically. And this is one of the things that I advocate very strongly in all my courses. Let's not think allopathically, this herb does this. Let's start to understand that nature is much more complicated and that using herbs is using nature's complex intelligence. And that's why it is being discovered over and over again that the antimicrobial herbs do not develop uh, resistance the way that the antimicrobial drugs do because the drugs in a certain way are not as intelligent as the plants. And so the microbes can become resistant to them rather easily actually, whereas the plants have been around for hundreds of millions of years and the microbes have to work a lot harder to become uh, resistant to their complex chemistry. That's a very quick answer. Now let's look at um, another aspect of this. How can you tell specifically how the plant medicine for a particular virus matches your body's particular chemistry? This is a very sophisticated question. Excellent, thank you for asking it. And it gives us an opportunity to look a little bit more at the complexities of using the antiviral herbs. Uh, but there's actually two questions here. And so the first one is, how can you tell specifically how plant medicine for a particular virus? Okay, that's the first part. And the question to turn it around is, are plant medicines specific for a particular virus? All right, that's the first question. Uh, so the question is based on an assumption that there's a plant and it's going to work against this virus. Okay, well, as I just mentioned, plants are more complicated than that. And even though we are receiving now a lot of evidence from research showing that a plant will work against a particular virus, it doesn't mean that it won't work against other viruses. And it also doesn't mean that it won't work against other microbes. So what we see then is that plants have broad spectrum antimicrobial powers. And frequently what you see is that a plant that is recognized as having antiviral powers also has antibacterial powers and antifungal powers, you see. That's because nature is complicated. So is there specific information? This plant does this against this virus? Yes. But is that the end of the story? No, plants do a lot more. So uh, the second part of this is that, um, uh, how can you tell the plant medicine matches your body's particular chemistry? All right, well, that is a very important question. And that's really where we need to take our evolution now to the next level is we have to combine the traditional information about how the plants work with the modern scientific research. So there's a lot of considerations actually about your individual body type and, and your health before you can start taking the antiviral herb safely. One of the reasons for that is because one of the main categories of antiviral herbs are very strong bitter types of herbs and they can upset your digestive system. So you need to understand that uh, there are, first of all, different categories of herbs that are antiviral and then which ones are going to behave in a certain way and affect the body in a certain way and how to combine them with other categories of herbs. So for example, a lot of the aromatic herbs that are in your kitchen, like uh, cinnamon and peppermint and Tulsi tea and these kind of things. These have known antiviral powers. And then some of the stronger bitter herbs like golden seal and coptis, the berberine yellow roots, these are going to also have strong antiviral powers, but you can't take them for very long because they'll start giving you digestive upset and they're hard on your liver. So what can you do? Well, you combine the two categories of herbs 
and you take the golden seal with some ginger tea and ginger is an antiviral herb. And so if you take the stronger golden seal uh, with the milder ginger tea, then it becomes biocompatible. So that's how we have to think about this uh, in terms of combining different categories of herbs uh, and making them biocompatible and making them digestible and making them so that you can take them for a different, different lengths of time and also target them specifically for where the symptoms are and what you're trying to accomplish. You see, so herbal medicine is fairly sophisticated at that individualized level. But we also have to look at a lot of considerations because uh, this question, you know, it opens up a big discussion. Uh, how can we tell if it matches your particular chemistry, your body chemistry? Well, there's different ways of defining body chemistry in classical medicine, traditional uh, Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. But basically what it comes down to is your constitution and your body type. And that has a lot to do with your age and the strength of your digestive system. Are you overweight? Are you underweight? Are you on medications? Uh, how old are you? You know, these, these kind of things all have to be taken into consideration. So herbal medicine is not cookie cutter. You see, herbal medicine is very individualized. It is not about uh, just take this pill and it's going to get rid of the virus. It's really about what plants does your individual system need? Now, we can use some allopathic type of thinking and we can say, all right, this herb or this group of herbs will target this family of viruses and will be beneficial for these symptoms. And we have centuries of evidence showing that they are used for conditions that even though they weren't known to be viral are you know, obviously viral now that we understand them. Uh, so there's a lot of information that, that we can use, but we do have to put it in the right, in the right context and uh, combine it so that whatever we are doing is more individualized. That's the main idea of how uh, we move our collective knowledge to the next level as we go from a generic sort of internet based uh, form of medicine and allopathic thinking and we start to appreciate the complexities of nature and all the different plants that we have and what is it that we need now for what particular purpose. And it, it is a very individualized prescription. So there's a couple of protocols that we could follow, however. Uh, um, what if there's an antiviral herb that you need, but it doesn't agree with you? That's another way of asking the question. Well, we wanna think about maybe it's too bitter, it's too laxative and uh, you can take it with something to counteract it. Uh, but ideally, you'd like to take something that does agree with you. And there's also uh, basic protocols for find the right herb for the type of infection, but also give it in the best form and mix it with things and get it targeted. And also there are different principles about how long to take things and at what dose. So these are all things that we think about. All right, so I hope that this is starting to give you a bigger picture of how complicated herbal medicine is, you see. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not really something that we can say, take this herb for immunity or take this herb for a virus. It doesn't really work that way, but it's actually much better that it doesn't work that way because it opens us up to the whole complexity of nature and it becomes very individualized and that's actually much better in the long run. So here's another question uh, that's closely related. All of these questions are, are sort of in the same vein to help uh, set the foundation here to understand what we're doing. Um, please repeat the balancing approach to chronic issues. Okay, so this is a question again from, from the intro call. Uh, I gave a basic protocol if something is acute versus chronic. And the simple principle here is we use higher doses of herbs for shorter times for more acute conditions. And we use lower doses for longer times for more chronic conditions. All right, so if you have an acute respiratory viral infection, that requires high doses of certain very strong herbs for a shorter period of time. But if you have a uh, chronic condition, um, low grade flare ups with herpes, for example, uh, that's going to require a, a much more um, 
long-term kind of dose, uh, long-term program with lower doses. And so we also think in terms of the stage of the illness. And so during the acute infectious stage, we attack. We attack the toxins with herbs that may not be good for a long period of time. And then in between, especially when things are cyclical, that's when we boost the immune system and strengthen the resistance against the virus. And I've seen many, many cases over the years where just building in between the flare-ups was enough to stop the flare-ups. You see, so that's a, another aspect here. When do we attack a virus and when do we build our system? So that's the polarity of functions that we think about. So thank you. Good question there. And similar with this question, do you have any suggestions for the post-virus period when there is still exhaustion and other lingering symptoms? And so again, I'm assuming that you're asking about COVID-19 illness uh, because there's so many kinds of uh, viral conditions uh, that might be uh, applicable in this particular question. Post-virus period, that could be for herpes. Um, it could be um, for many different things. But the basic protocol is, is the same, and that is we use the nutritive tonics and the adaptogenic herbs primarily to rebuild and strengthen the immune system so that the virus doesn't come back. Or if it does come back, it doesn't last as long as not as strong. So many people now are hearing about the adaptogenic herbs, but the nutritive tonics and adaptogenic herbs and neuroendocrine balancing herbs, those are the ones we think about. Those are things like maca and rhodiola and astragalus and reishi mushroom and chaga mushroom and milky oat seed and so forth. These are all the things that build us up. And that is, by the way, one of the great deficiencies of allopathic medicine is that there's no pharmaceutical drug that can really nourish the body. Uh, that's a great aspect of herbal medicine that is really coming out now, is that we need concentrated nutrients from plants and no pharmaceutical drug will do that. All right, let's see. I'll go for a few more minutes here and then turn it back to Lisa because I know she has some things to say. Many, many questions came in about oregano oil. This is such a popular uh, essential oil. Unfortunately, it's also one of the most dangerous and uh, oregano oil is responsible. Not the oregano oil. I should say the misuse of oregano oil is responsible for an epidemic, another epidemic of adverse reactions and poisoning cases. And that's because it's being sold through multi-level marketing channels primarily. And the goal of multi-level marketing is to make money. It's not necessarily uh, accompanied with the proper level of education. And so people are burning their children by putting undiluted oregano oil on the skin, thinking that it's going to boost their immune system. And then when the child starts screaming because their skin's turning red and burning, they're told that it is a detox reaction. Well, it's actually contact dermatitis. It's a toxic reaction. There's a huge misconception about essential oils in general, and they're very concentrated, and some of them are extremely toxic, and oregano oil is responsible for countless, countless adverse reactions, skin burning, gastric irritation, gastritis, esophageal damage, all sorts of things from oregano oil. Now, does that mean that oregano oil is bad? No, it just means that it's really, really powerful. That's all. And that means you need a higher level of education. Don't just put it on your tongue. It's going to burn you. Don't just swallow it. It's going to burn all the way down. And if you have gastritis, it's going to flare up that gastritis very seriously. Now, what role does oregano oil have? It's um, pretty limited. If you put a few drops in a diffuser for background fragrancing, it's going to dilute it so that it could actually have a protective effect for your respiratory system, some degree of neutralizing airborne pathogens. You can mix it with eucalyptus oil and things like that. So there are some things that uh, oregano oil can be used for, but it's so concentrated that it's just dangerous and people aren't being told how to use it correctly. So uh, what I always advocate is unless you have a really good background and education and how to use essential oil safely, just use the whole herb. So just put oregano in your soup. You're going to get the same antimicrobial, antioxidant and immune boosting functions 
but you're going to get it at a biocompatible level. There's absolutely no reason to to uh, put a drop of oregano oil on your tongue. That's like eating that's like eating like a pound of oregano. Who would want to do that? All right. Speaking of using things safely, I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to give you that formula that I gave on the intro call. And the way that I uh, gave it, this is just for general respiratory influenza. I'm not making any claims here about any cures. This is based on tradition. It's also validated by science. I'm, I'm not saying, oh, you can prevent COVID-19 or you can go treat somebody who's on a ventilator with it. I mean, a lot of these questions are not very practical because when people get really sick with this, it's not in the realm of herbal medicine, you see. But this is just a general home pharmacy concept and everybody should have information about how to treat respiratory, upper respiratory viruses, just as part of our, our knowledge of how to take care of ourselves. What I give is uh, several different lists. All right, I'm gonna do this fairly quickly and I hope this time you're ready for it. I give teas for infusion and the standard preparation is one teaspoon or a tablespoon, it's pretty flexible, of dried herb per cup hot water infused about five to 10 minutes. And the teas that I recommend, thyme, peppermint, elderflowers, sage, tulsi, yarrow, and linden. Okay, I hope you got that. Thyme, peppermint, elderflowers, sage, tulsi, yarrow, and linden. And then tinctures that you can add to that. Um, myrrh, plantain, licorice, osha, red root, Yerba Santa, Isotis, Chinese Skullcap, and Grindelia. All right, I know this is going very quickly, but we have a lot to cover. Myrrh, plantain, licorice, osha, red root, Yerba Santa, Isotis, Chinese Skullcap, and Grindelia. Now here's a list of some essential oils. Thyme, eucalyptus, conifers, like spruce, pine, and fir. Uh, tea tree, uh, Ravansara is very good, Ravansara, Helichrysum, Frankincense, so Helichrysum, Frankincense. Okay, now what do you do? So you can make a tea uh, from one of the herbs that I gave in the first list, like uh, you can make fresh ginger root tea, um, and you can make an infusion like of um, peppermint, okay, as I mentioned. And um, uh, you can then add some of the tinctures. Okay, so just from the list, there's all kinds of ways you can combine these. So how about if you make a cup of Tulsi tea, one tablespoon of dry Tulsi infused in a cup of water, hot, hot water. And then why don't you add uh, a dropper full, standard one ounce bottle dropper of um, your Basanta tincture. You see, and that's going to have a beautiful expectorant effect for the lungs. Or you can just kind of mix and match. There's all kinds of ways to put this together. Like, for example, yarrow. You can make the same infusion of the yarrow tea. And uh, then you could um, put some tincture of Grindelia in it. That's from the other list of tinctures. Okay, so what would you like to do with essential oils? Well, how about a few drops of eucalyptus? Inhale it. Okay, or uh, a few drops of um, conifer oils in a diffuser in the background, and you can put some tea tree in that. That's where you can use your oregano oil, actually, is in the diffuser. That's quite, that's quite safe. Okay, now, this takes a bit of time to go through this and explain all of this. Uh, and that's why we have a five-week course, because there's so much information. It takes time to learn how to do herbal medicine. I'm going to do one more question here. I, I hope that you were able to grab that information quickly. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to post it. But I'm going to do one more question because there's so many good questions that came in that I really like to touch on. And um, this is part of another series. Uh, it's really important to understand about herbal medicine in general. And then after this, I'll turn it back to you, Lisa. So uh, this question is, so many older people are on blood thinners or a gazillion other medications which seem to preclude most herbal treatments. Are there any safe ways to help this population for acute conditions using herbs? And the answer is yes and no. And again, it's very individual, but there's basically two classes of medications that are really problematic that always are a red flag. One is blood thinners 
and the other is the uh, psych, um, the psychoactive medications, the SSRIs uh, for depression and anxiety. And so if people are on anxiolytics, it's, diff it's difficult to actually just switch over to natural treatments. You need, it's, it's not that difficult actually, you just need to do it carefully, all right? And um, the difficulty is that the anxiolytic medications and the antidepressants are very, very habituating. And that is something you have to be very careful with. But blood thinners, uh, this is a very difficult medical situation in general. And then you don't want to be adding anything that's going to affect the blood chemistry, especially things like ginkgo that are going to thin the blood more. Okay, But here's the interesting thing about this. People always think about herb-drug interactions as being negative, you see. And that's why this question is here. Um, but uh, there's actually far more drug-drug interactions that are negative. There's only a handful, really, of herb-drug interactions that we need to be concerned about. Like, don't take ginkgo if you're on warfarin, okay? And uh, don't take St. John's wort if you are on antidepressants. There are a few others. There are things to know, but there's a vast number of drug-drug interactions. And there's actually more food-drug interactions than there are herb-drug interactions. And something else that people don't understand is that there's a tremendous amount of positive herb-drug interactions. And this is the future of medicine, really, because antiviral herbs can be given along with antiviral drugs. And that means you can reduce the dosage of the antiviral drugs. And that means that it's going to give them more longevity so that the viruses don't become resistant as quickly. And the um, same is happening with cancer drugs, you see. So there's a lot of ways that herbs with certain compounds can support the drugs with similar kinds of compounds. And that way we have less adverse reactions and greater longevity of the drugs. So. Uh, the general principle, though, to answer your question specifically about uh, older people on multiple medications, and this is very, very common. Uh, first of all, don't stop anything. This is a case where you need to work with a clinician, a holistic medical doctor who knows herbs, which is kind of rare, or a naturopathic doctor who knows herbs, which is more, much more common. That's what they're trained for. But you want to use gentle supportive herbs. So don't think so much about treating acute conditions in elderly people who are on lots of medications. That's really not practical because the level of skill that's required and the conditions that those patients are going to be in pretty much precludes even being able to get these medicines, okay? But that doesn't mean that herbal medicine can't play a tremendous role in supporting elderly people. It's just that we need to do something a little bit more proactive. We need to get our parents to eat better. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. And use simple supportive herbs and improve lifestyle habits. Now, here's the real issue here. It's not an herbal problem. It's a family problem. And a lot of times, um, our best intentions cannot be tr translated into anything on a practical level. It's always challenging and difficult and a lot of times counterproductive to trying to get our friends and loved ones to, to take care of themselves. And it's just the way things are. And so the best solution is that if your elderly parents or uh, friends or relatives and loved ones are ready to start making positive changes, the first thing that they should do is start to get on a healthier lifestyle program, improve nutritional status, and step by step, they may be able to reduce some of the medications that they're on. So a lot of the thinking around herbal medicine and COVID-19 is, is really like end stage, and it's not practical. We can't think in terms of what are we going to do with an elderly patient on many medications with herbs. We can't think like that because it's just not practical. We have to think in terms of what steps can we take now preventively for the long term. And that's where our society needs to go. It really needs to take natural medicine to a much higher level in terms of integrated into our lifestyle now 
so that we're not thinking in terms of an immunological emergency that we have to take care of. And we have to basically catch up on 10 years of uh, knowledge and learning and practice and all that. We just have to start thinking in more long-term cycles and using natural medicine much more holistically like that. Okay, so I hope that's a, a helpful start on this very big subject. And uh, Lisa, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Okay, great, thank you, David. In fact, I'll just go ahead and uh, answer some questions about the course itself, because we are getting questions about that. So go ahead and take a break. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, we're here with David Crow learning about his upcoming course, Botanical Antivirals, which begins Wednesday, May 13th. And you can log on to botanicalantivirals.com for all the details and to register. And again, people are asking uh, details about the course itself. So let me go ahead and take care of those because David's expertise is, is all of the, <laughs> the herbal stuff. I can tell you about the class itself. Um, again, it's called Botanical Antivirals, and this is going to be a five-week journey with David and his expert guidance. And this is where you'll explore ancient, powerful, tried and true antiviral herbs from your own garden to your local grocery store and beyond uh, to safely and effectively address viral conditions and create your healthiest life. And the five week course takes place on Wednesdays at noon Pacific, same time as this, this conversation right here, starting Wednesday, May 13th. And if you can't join us live, that's fine. You won't miss any of the teachings because you'll receive audio and video recordings, transcripts, all the course handouts that David was talking about earlier. That's gonna be all in one place on your course homepage. Also, we, uh, we offer a no risk money back guarantee on all of our courses, giving you until May 20th, in this case, to make sure that it's a good fit. We want you to be happy. And as an added option, all participants are welcome to connect in a private Facebook community group so you can connect with one another. Also, everyone who registers receives the Botanical Antivirals bonus collection. Lots of good stuff here. Uh, first, you'll get an audio dialogue with uh, Kurt Schnabelt and David called Understanding and Effectively Using the Antimicrobial Powers of Essential Oils. You'll also receive an audio dialogue with David and Kay Ruby Bloom entitled Gardens and Grassroots Healthcare. And then this is pretty cool. You're gonna receive a full 17 part audio course from David entitled Combining Herbs and Essential Oils. And of course, you will get a 20% discount from David's store, the Floricopia online store. And when you register by midnight Pacific on Thursday, May 7th, you'll receive an extra gift, and that is selected audio recordings from the Plant Medicine Summit 2019. And I think that covers uh, everything that people were asking. So let's go ahead and toss it back to David. Why don't you tell us, what are you most looking forward to sharing in this? Uh, this is a new upcoming course so with sort of a, a very specialized focus. What are you most looking forward to here? Well, this information is really important for everybody. And of course, the starting point is everyone is concerned about the teen epidemic, pandemic. But really, this is part of a much larger selection of viral infections. And keep in mind that there are many pandemics that are happening. HIV is still a pandemic. Uh, there is dengue and there's Ebola and, and so many things. So really what we need to do is uh, keep evolving our knowledge about uh, herbal medicine and its role in treating health conditions. So with this pandemic, what we have is the opportunity to learn a lot more about how to take care of ourselves. And the more we learn about how to take care of ourselves, the more health conscious we become, the more health conscious we become as a society. And the more health conscious we are as a society, the more we're going to start seeing the interconnections between things like pandemics and climate change. And we're going to start to appreciate the role of the plants because the plants are going to be a crucial factor for a huge number of people when it comes to boosting immunity and for taking care of our health. And as I mentioned, there's no pharmaceutical drug that will give the body nutrition. And that's why we need medicinal plants as sources of concentrated nutrients. But there's also no pharmaceutical drug that will detoxify the body. 
all the pharmaceutical drugs have that particular limitation is that they lack the nutrients to build us up and strengthen us, give us vitality and resistance, which we need against viral epidemics and viral conditions. But there's no pharmaceutical drug that will actually detoxify the body either. And that, that doesn't mean that pharmaceutical drugs are bad. It just means that that's their limitation. And plant medicine takes care of everything else. And plant medicine gives us the nutrients to strengthen ourselves. And plant medicine supports the natural detoxification processes of the body. So as the world becomes more toxic, we need medicinal plants more. And as we become increasingly depleted overall through all the conditions that are happening, we need nutrients more. So this is just another installment in uh, the work that I've been doing for decades and decades, which suddenly seems to be incredibly relevant more than ever. So that's what I'm looking forward to. All right, beautiful. And for those of you who are sending in questions, asking David to repeat the list that he offered a little earlier, uh, let me just let you know that this recording will be available uh, on Facebook. It's not gonna go anywhere. And the page that you're watching it, if you're on the Shift Network, you should be able to watch it again. And the list that David offered were at about 25 minutes in or so. So that'll help you to fast forward. And those of you who are just joining us, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but David Crow uh, gave a, a pretty comprehensive list of teas and tinctures uh, and herbs uh, or uh, essential oils that you can use for antibacterial, antiviral purposes. So once again, the name of the upcoming course is Botanical Antivirals, it begins Wednesday, May 13th, and you can log on to botanicalantivirals.com for all the details and to register. So let's go ahead and toss it back to David because he's got so much more to talk about. All right. Thank you, Lisa. And yes, there is so much more. We're definitely not going to cover all of this. So here's a couple questions that are uh, continuing with this general discussion, putting the antiviral herbs into a more personalized context. Can antiviral herbs protect those who have an underlying condition like Crohn's disease or Lyme disease? Uh, or is the protective effect minimized? And another similar question, can antivirals help with chronic Lyme disease or mycoplasma pneumonia? Now, this goes back to understanding the individualized nature of applying herbal medicine. So in general, we can say that the antiviral herbs can be used for people with underlying health conditions, but those underlying health conditions have to be considered before we use herbs that are antiviral. For example, uh, Crohn's disease makes a person extremely reactive to anything that's consumed. Uh, foods have to be monitored very carefully and a food that can feel good and digest well uh, for one particular week can suddenly become like poison in the digestive tract the next week. Uh, so it's a very unstable autoimmune condition, inflammatory bowel condition. And it is also very, very sensitive to the bitter herbs. So we would not choose the bitter antivirals, but there may be some herbs that could be helpful for people with Crohn's disease that support their digestive system, you see. And so this is another way to think about herbal medicine is that we don't have to think just in terms of antiviral herbs to get antiviral powers. If we're improving our digestive function, we are increasing our immunity and resistance to viruses, even though we're not treating viruses directly. Now with Lyme, the answer is yes. And again, you have to look at this on an individual level, but it, um, uh, it really depends on the strength of the person, the condition, and so forth. But excellent question. Now, here's just a, a, a simple question about applying herbs. And uh, this is about the details of what happens when you take these bitter herbs, these terrible tasting antiviral herbs. The sweetening bitter herbs with raw honey reduce their effectiveness. Well, uh, if you don't take the herbs, it will reduce their effectiveness because you're not gonna get them in your body. So if you need to sweeten them with honey to get them in, you are improving their effectiveness by just consuming them. But taking them with honey is going to reduce their effectiveness because we should actually be tasting the bitter 
And that's a principle of using a lot of the antimicrobial herbs is that they are strongly bitter and, and they do give us uh, activation of the entire digestive system all the way down. The, these are the most clinical, some of the strongest herbs that we work with. All right, here's another uh, question. And this is uh, fairly representative of a lot of the kind of thinking that people have about using herbal medicine here. And that is, there's evidence that many COVID-19 vir virus deaths have been caused by blood clotting that led to heart attacks and or strokes. Will herbs that support circulation help with this clotting complication? So this is a type of question and I'm answering it here because it will answer a lot of questions that people have not specifically about what will herbs do, but more about how do we think about herbs, okay? So this is a theoretical question, really, because there's no practical way to apply this information. So let's think about it. If a person is uh, in the hospital with COVID-19, they're not really candidates for herbal medicine, you see? And so if we're going to think about, well, are we, are we going to prevent blood clotting during COVID-19, well, that means that we have to have a pretty sophisticated herbal program. We're going to have to work with the person very individually. And again, this level of um, information is, you know, people are looking for this level of information, how to treat the acute pneumonia of COVID-19, how to prevent or treat blood clotting from uh, the acute stage of COVID-19. But I just want to respond here and, and just say that this is not really the realm of herbal medicine, okay? Herbal medicine can be used very, very effectively for many kinds of viral conditions, okay? And that includes boosting our immunity against um, this particular pandemic. It, it plays a role and it plays a role in the treatment, okay? of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is what causes COVID-19 illness, all right? But we are in the very, very early stages of learning about this virus and learning about this pandemic. We have a lot of information from the past we can draw from. There's a lot of scientific evidence now about the ways that the antiviral herbs work, okay? But we are going to be finding a step at a time as we go through this pandemic what herbal medicine can do and what it cannot do and where it is strongest and where allopathic medicine is strongest. We're just a few months into this, okay? This is information that we don't know a lot about yet. And it's very important to recognize that in the more acute phases, this is not an herbal program. However, I know for a fact that herbal medicine can be a very, very important treatment for COVID-19 at certain stages in certain people, in certain conditions, okay? And I also know for a fact that herbal medicine is going to be the primary treatment for people recovering, you see. But a lot of questions that come are really out of context because they're talking about managing things that even in the hospital cannot be managed. All right, so that's the answer. And it's a very big, important question, but what it really points to is the learning curve that everybody, doctors, hospitals, herbalists, healthcare practitioners, patients, everybody is going to be finding out a piece at a time about what works best. And so what I will say is that herbal medicine works best for strengthening us, for preventive purposes. If you have underlying conditions, don't just think about, oh, I should take an immune boosting herb uh, against the virus. Think about correcting the underlying conditions. Do you have hypertension? Do you have a circulatory disorder? Use herbal medicine for that, okay? We don't have to think about, we have to protect ourselves from the virus if we're facing having uh, you know, a stroke instead. Let's take care of our cardiovascular system or let's take, let's take care of our uh, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome first. Let's take care of the things that could potentially weaken us rather than just think in terms of boosting our immune system. So thank you, excellent, excellent question. So Lisa, I'll turn it back to you in case you have any final 
comments that you want. And otherwise, I have plenty more questions to keep on going. Okay, well then go ahead and keep on going. I've, I've uh, given them my information and you have plenty more to share, so go for it. Okay, great. Well, now we can uh, talk about a few more um, personal health challenges that came in and also r relate these to um, our course. So here's one. Uh, are there any herbs that help with increasing white blood cells? Mine have been very low and I'm really concerned and want to know if I can increase them with herbs. Okay, this is uh, relevant because the white blood cells are one of the most fundamental aspect of our immune resistance. And so I will say, yes, there are herbs that boost our white blood cells. And one of the main ones is astragalus. And of course, astragalus is flying off the shelf now. Uh, it is still available through major sources. <clears throat> astragalus is a very safe herb, actually. And it is uh, working primarily to boost the immune system by boosting the levels of white blood cells and red, red blood cells. Astragalus is a very good herb to use after um, blood loss. Uh, for women who have very heavy periods, for example, um, it's a blood building herb, but it's also a major immune boosting herb because it builds the blood. So there's a relationship between the blood and immunity that's um, uh, very clear and specifically the white blood cells, okay, lymphocytes. So the other part of my answer to this is that you need to find out why you have low blood cell count. That's all. It may be something that you can address just by taking astragalus or some of the other blood building kinds of herbs. And there's a lot of blood building herbs. Uh, there are things that are in the mineral, uh, um, mineral rich herb category. There's things like nettles, for example, or alfalfa. They build the blood through their minerals. There's um, blood tonics in Chinese medicine. One of the most important is called Shao Wu, okay? And Shao Wu, which is spelled S-H-O-U, S-H-O-U, W-U, Shao Wu, is a major herb for helping boost our vitality in general. So vitality building herbs translate into immune boosting as well. But the real concern here medically, if I hear a question like this, is, is I would just say, well, why? Why do you have low blood cell count? Because it could be something simple that you could take herbs for symptomatically, and that's the end of the story, problem is solved. But it could also be that you have a more serious underlying condition that really needs to be diagnosed and find out what's happening. Okay, here's another one that comes in uh, very often, actually, and uh, I'm always surprised how many people have had their gallbladders taken out. Uh, and this is relevant to our antiviral herbs as well. How do you adjust any of your advice for people who do not have a gallbladder? Well, this is very common. And the uh, main problem that we see is that it is not just um, that there's a, a weakening of the digestive power, but there's also a whole set of adverse conditions, reactions, symptoms that happen after uh, cholecystectomy. And so it's a syndrome. It's called post-cholecystectomy syndrome. And in this syndrome, uh, the symptoms are caused by the inability to regulate the flow of bile from because there's no gallbladder. Releasing it as needed, it's just sort of continually running out of the liver. And the symptoms include dyspepsia, which is pain and bloating of the upper GI tract, indigestion, nausea, vomiting, flatulence, diarrhea, persistent upper right quadrant pain, and, and so forth. And my answer then to your question specifically, how do we adjust the advice is, well, we treat that condition. We treat the condition of missing a gallbladder. And that's more important than um, trying to boost our immune system or attack viruses. Because taking care of our digestive system will boost our immune system. And it will protect us more than anything. So the main herbs that we use for this are um, demulcents. 
things that are coding to the digestive tract because frequently the flow of the bile is causing irritation and inflammation. So things like slippery elm, which makes a mucilaginous drink, uh, marshmallow root, the powder, just a little bit, maybe a quarter to a half a teaspoon in a large glass of water, first thing in the morning, can have a very, very nice effect, especially if there's diarrhea, because that's called a bulking laxative. It can actually just sort of form stools because of its mucilaginous nature. Sometimes the mild aromatic herbs, like chewing cardamom seed or fennel seed, can also be combined with that, and it helps nicely. So that's the basis of helping to soothe the digestive sensitivity that happens after the gallbladder is taken out. Now, in those cases, it's like the question about Crohn's disease or any type of inflammatory bowel condition. We don't use the strong bitter herbs because we might think, okay, I need this antiviral herb to treat this viral condition. But if it doesn't agree with the digestive system, then we shouldn't use it. All right, here's one last question here. And I think this is um, appropriate advice for our pandemic. Does tea tree oil kill the virus when you put it on the surface of your mask? Good practical question, all right? And tea tree is not the only essential oil you might think of to put on the surface of your mask. You could put maybe Ravansara. That is a very well-known antiviral type of essential oil now. Lots of documentation about this. But eucalyptus oil, and guess what? Lavender has documented antiviral powers. As a matter of fact, there's virtually no essential oil where we cannot find documented antimicrobial powers. And as I mentioned at the beginning, those antimicrobial powers are going to be very broad spectrum. Okay, so anything that's documented as being effective against a bacteria will most likely work against the virus also because of the complex nature of botanical immunity and the way that they attack things. So yes, um, there's a high likelihood that if you put some tea tree oil on the front of your mask, I wouldn't advise putting it necessarily directly against the inside, against your nose. But if you put it on the front of the mask, it'll kill any viruses that are there and it will create a, a filter. But here's the problem. It's also going to give you a really strong continual dose of an essential oil vapor into your sinuses. And that could start to irritate you. So it is a concept but it's a concept that we have to work with a little bit carefully. And just because somebody says, put some essential oil on your mask, good concept, okay? But in practical application, you might end up with, with uh, a dermotoxic reaction in the shape of a mask, all right? And no, that's not detox. That's a dermotoxic reaction, okay? It's burning your skin. Tea tree is notorious for burning the skin. So keep it off of your skin. But you might want to just put a little bit and spread it all over and then air out the mask for a, a few minutes. Or another idea is you might want to just use aromatherapy in general with whatever essential oil you like. Do you like neroli orange blossom? Put some of that on your mask. Do you like lavender? Do you like geranium? You don't have to breathe tea tree because the essential oils are, are going to have some kind of antimicrobial powers. And you might as well Give yourself a nice aromatherapy treatment that also lifts your mood. And so you could use lavender and neroli or clary sage on your mask to give you a better uh, outlook on life while you're also protecting yourself from viruses. So I hope that's helpful. And Lisa, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, David. This has been a, really a greatly informational conversation. Uh, I want to thank our viewers before we go for being with us today and for all of the questions you submitted. Uh, once again, Botanical Antiviral starts Wednesday, May 13th, and you can visit botanicalantivirals.com to learn more and to register. Uh, David, do you have anything left? Do you want to share any final words or have you have are you spent? Oh, no, I'm just getting warmed up. I could go for hours doing all of this. And that's why we're going to have a course. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Obviously, I 
chose some of the questions that help to understand the role of the antiviral herbs the most and to deal with some of the concerns that people have about the pandemic to help us really understand the clinical thinking behind this. Because there is a lot of misunderstanding, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of marketing, there's a lot of things that are being promoted uh, that we don't know if they're actually going to be very effective. In some cases, no, they're not. We already do know, actually. But herbal medicine has tremendous potential with all of this, but we cannot keep thinking in the same way about herbal medicine. We can't just think allopathically about herbal medicine. We really have to evolve our knowledge and understanding so that we're becoming more sophisticated in our thinking about what herbal medicine is. And that's very holistic. It's very individualized. It's much stronger than people realize, has more potential than people realize. It's a lot easier than a lot of people realize. But it also has to be understood in a particular context, when it can be used, how it should be used, who should use it. There are no simple answers really, but at the same time, it's a simple, healthy form of medicine. And the more we know about it, the more benefit we're going to get. So I hope that that was helpful for everybody. And thank you for joining us in this call. And Lisa, thank you as always for hosting. It's my pleasure. Thank you again, David. It's always uh, fascinating. I learned so much. And once again, thank you to everyone who joined us today. On behalf of all of us at the Shift Network, I wish you well and look forward to having you on this course or perhaps another one in the future. Be well, everyone.